Hello everyone, my name is Hong Wei Bao. I'm a social professor in media studies from the University of Nottingham. Today, my talk is titled Performing Queer at the Theater Documentary Convergence Mediated Queer Activism in China. Uh, the talk is based in, uh, on one chapter from uh, this book, uh, Contemporary Chinese Queer Performance. So, the focus for today's talk is really about uh, a particular type of activism practiced in contemporary China in the past two decades, from the 2000s to 2010s. I'm going to use a filmmaker, an activist, what performance practice or activist practice as an example to demonstrate how this activist strategy works. And to theorize it, I'm coining a, a, a one word that is called theater documentary convergence to describe the intermediate and transmedia queer activism practiced in contemporary China. In doing so, I'm also reflecting on the localized queer activist strategies in different parts of the world, which do or do not have to follow the Western activist strategies or models. So I'm going to use three to four examples from Fan Purpose activist films as examples. Okay, so to give you an idea of who the case study artist or filmmaker is, Fan Purpose is one of China's leading queer uh, filmmakers and activists. So while he was in China, he made a lot of community documentaries. He also organized the Beijing Queer Film Festival and China uh, Queer Film Festival tour. And he was uh, a director and board member of the Beijing LGBT Center. And currently he's in Berlin making feature films, but his Documentary films were some of the earliest and some of the, or in a way, most representative Chinese queer documentaries produced in the 2000s and 2010s. So I'm going to use some examples to demonstrate how what I call intermediality or theater documentary convergence works in the context of Chinese queer activism. So I'll just say one thing, which is that uh, although Fan Popo was trained in script writing at Beijing uh, uh, Film Academy, so writing and films, in a way, actually, are not that, that distinctively separable in China's literary, uh, literary and cultural scene, uh, pretty much because of China, China's intellectual tradition of uh, the yin he, that is the uh, shadow play. So the film, when film was invented, it was seen as a former theatrical play. So Fan Popo's film was described as very theatrical and dramatical, and even sometimes melodramatic, where it involves queer family narratives. And Fan himself describes him as the main melody filmmaker within the queer communities. So his film may seem less queer, actually from the uh, a more avant-garde radical perspective, but they have a huge impact on Chinese queer communities today, and it shapes particular type of queer activism. So Fan is also known as the Chinese queer filmmaker who brought China's censor to the court. So essentially he sued the China's media regulator, which is a state administration of radio, film and television to the court. So it was a very, in a way, a sensational uh, in a media event. And after that, he was, of course, in, in, in trouble and his films were even uh, more impossible to be shown in China. So as a result, he had to move to Berlin and live as a queer diaspora. So this is uh, an interview with Fan Puo Puo 
during uh, the Berlinale, where he acted as a jury member. Hi, Bowen. Thank you for being part of the Teddy Jury this year. Can you start by giving a brief introduction of yourself and your work? Uh, hello, my name is Bobo Fan. I'm from China, uh, but recently living in Berlin. Um, I'm committee member of the Beijing Queer Film Festival. I have been working for it since 2007, and I'm also a filmmaker. Previously made a lot of the documentary featuring LGBT families in China. Now uh, in Berlin doing more fictional and experimental uh, short movies. Um, but your previous films that you made, I think they have been used to sort of quite an activist purpose within China. I wondered if you think queer film can and should be used for activism. I think uh, film is definitely one of the very important tools for communication. Uh, so my understanding uh, about film in the beginning was uh, uh, something able to change the society. Of course, I was too naive. The world won't be changed just by film. Uh, so uh, I would say activism documentary is one of the ways uh, of uh, filmmaking. Um, so that's why also right now I'm uh, exploring more diverse ways of the uh, uh, filmmaking and more contribution to the um, queer film culture and uh, a society. Okay, so that was Fan Po Po and his wish uh, as a queer activist was to change society through making films. Although he acknowledges that the film can alone cannot change society, still it plays a role in raising people's awareness about gender and sexual diversity. It empowers the communities and individuals in a particular way, limited as it is. Okay, so the first example that I want to talk about is, uh, in a way, the first best known documentary by. Po Po Fan, co-directed with uh, David Chang, which is called New Beijing, New Marriage. And of course, this is a parody for, of the Beijing Olympics slogan, New Beijing, New Olympics, etc. So it was made in 2009, one year after the Olympics. So what Po Po did was essentially to document an activist event in central Beijing on Tianmen Street for those who are familiar with Beijing's geography. So Tianmen is just in front of Tianmen and it's a popular tourist and market area. So there are lots of people there. And uh, before Olympics, the Tianmen area was repaved and renovated and it was full of people. So one day, so a group of people, a group of gays and lesbian activists went to Tianmen to take some wedding photos. So I'm going to show you some uh, short film clip from New Beijing, New Marriage. So remember, it was a documentation of a real event happening in Tianmen on that day. <laughs> Okay, so that was the film clip from this very short film, which, which was about 20 minutes, uh, documenting the same-sex wedding, or really wedding photo shoots event. So as you can see, the two gay couple uh, and uh, a lesbian couple really I mean, appeared there taking photos, showing different 
gestures of intimacy, and then people looked on, and people showed different uh, uh, expressions. Some uh, showed their approval and support, but other people showed doubts and even disapproval. In a way, in a way, it's quite interesting because it captures people's responses to the event. And through interviewing people at the time of the event, and was the activist also, in a way, communicated the message of gender and sexual equality to the public. And of course, the filming of the process, the filming process is only one part of the activism. So after this film was made, it was circulated at uh, queer venues, queer film festivals, and shown at university campuses, etc. And it really acted as a form of activism to raise awareness of gender and sexual equal, uh, uh, equality. And also, uh, although gay rights, the, the, the right discourse may not well, function perfectly in China. However, the same-sex marriage discourse is a more, you know, a publicly acceptable, you know, a discourse. At least it is seen as less controversial because of the, in a way, the heterosexual norms of marriage. Okay, so that was an activist event being captured by the documentary. And of course, the documentary here is performative. So when I say performative, which means the documentary actually shapes the event that is happening rather than documenting the event as it is happening. So when I say shape the event, because the documentarians actually interview people and ask people's responses. And this event is designed, was designed in the first place as a documented event rather than as an event that will just appear and it will never leave any trace in history. So that's uh, Fan Po Hu Zheng Kai Gui's 2009 documentary, New Beijing, New Marriage. And after that, Fan made a few documentaries, including one documentary about the performance of China monologues in China. As you might know, Vagina Monologue was a feminist play, was an American feminist play symbolizing the kind of liberal feminist, the fe feminist political stance. And uh, in China, it was performed first on oh, uh, Song Yasen University campus in 2003. And then uh, in 2013-ish, so the uh, play uh, had its 10 year anniversary. To celebrate this 10 year anniversary, so Fan basically what interviewed different people and documented different versions of the performance as a play in different cities. So three cities, uh, Guangzhou in South China, Shanghai in South China, and Beijing in North China. So different feminist groups have put on the play. And some of the feminist groups also work with queer groups or articulate a very strong sense of queer feminism. For example, transgender people appeared on stage and queer people also talk about their, their, their marginalization. So in a way, it really forges a link between feminist activism and queer activism. And of course, so this was a documentation of a feminist play. So the performance element is already there in the narrative. So by dubbing and by, you know, a montaging and or all the performance sequences and people's interviews, the play uh, and the film actually demonstrates the relevance of feminism to contemporary China. So that's a film clip from the, the China monologues. Thank 
Okay, so that uh, is the trailer for the China monologues. So essentially through documenting the performance and through interviews with the, perform uh, with the performers and with the theater makers, uh, uh, Fan really actually engages with the feminist and queer debate. And in particular, this, well, this film was made when at a time when there was huge debate between feminist and queer politics and between LGBT identity politics and queer politics. So it in a way played a very important role in participating the debate through the circulation of the film in different venues in China. It bridges feminism with queer theory. It also challenges the kind of the uh, Eve Ensler's original version of liberal feminism, brings in debates from transnational feminism, post-colonial feminism, and socialist feminism. So, uh, of course, uh, Fan Popo's most famous documentary was Mama Rainbow. And after Mama Rainbow, he made another film called Papa Rainbow, this time focusing on the dads or the fathers of queer children. So, and well, the difficulty with what well, shooting the deaths is that most of the men interviewed were not good at expressing, uh, expressing themselves. What Fan Popo did was to put together a film perf or a theater performance and ask those dads actually to play roles on stage. So when the fathers were on stage, actually, they tend to forget their, you know, their original selves in life and try to, you know, create a different character. But of course, that character is also based on real life. It's basically how fathers cope with children's queer sexuality. So in the picture here, you see a dad, what, you know, criticizing a trans child. Well, in a way, they are all actors, they are all act, uh, activists. But through this, actually, they involve the audience into the discussion. They adopted the particular format of foreign theater, which is to invite the audience to shape the narrative, the play, for example. So after they perform this sequence, and they will ask the audience, oh, in your position, what would you do? And then, the uh, audience will give some suggestions and the theater crew will perform the sequence again using that now using the narratives from the audience or taking on the audience suggestion so this is called forum theater so the making of the documentary you know it coincides with the making of this theater the documentary the documentation of the theater production becomes a documentary of the former queer activism and it bridges with the in a way, the gap between different generations and creates an opportunity for queer children and their parents to engage with each other. So this is the trailer from Papa Rainbow. So that's a dad performing. Okay, so as you can see that uh, uh, the film was presented by P-Flag China, that's parents and 
friends of lesbians and gay people and queer comrades, which is a community webcast. In other words, so Fan worked closely with community organizations such as PFLAG and queer comrades to produce this. And of course, this film was shown, actually has been shown in different community venues and among queer groups and so on, participating in the discussion about how queer people cope with familial relationships and how parents can understand their children better. So continuing the theme of the parent-children relationship, uh, Fan Po Po participated in a documentary theater produced by uh, Ibsen International and Nanlo Guxiang Performance Arts Festival, Shanghai International Theater Festival. So what's interesting about, uh, about the parents and their child is that it's a documentary theater. In other words, they interview parents and children in real life in different parts of the China. And then after the interview, they use the interview footage as the, the material for the theater. And then they also use some of the interview footage actually on theater stage as part of the theater. And the process, whole process has been documented. So Fan Popo was responsible for the cinematic documentary part. Uh, yeah, uh, so uh, in collaboration with Zhou Xueping. So let's give, I'll give you an idea of the, in a way, the interview process and the trailer of this project in its digital format. This is a film trailer from the uh, theater project about my parents and their child. And of course, in the theater performance, the, the production itself brought together the film and the performances as well as the raw materials from the interviews. Okay, so I have used some examples. I think a lot of examples such as, are, in a way, are self-evident that they are instances of performance. For example, the documentary theater, the forum theater project, the performance of the you know, feminist play, vagina monologues, etc. And they are more obvious. And other films actually, even if they're not directly about theater performance, they also have a very strong dramatic element. So I'm really trying to think about actually why do Fan Po Po and other Chinese feminist and queer activists use the combination of theater and performance, uh, theater and documentary? So there are many, many reasons. For example, there's media and cultural specificities of each genre. So uh, theater is more, in a way, dramatic and it, uh, it can involve people more on the spot but it's in a way fleeting and ephemeral. It cannot be recorded. 
So the best way to record it is to record it in a documentary. A documentary, of course, especially a digital documentary, is easier to transmit and to disseminate so that it can actually be disseminated in digital space and achieve a greater impact. And of course, if it is a boring documentary, it wouldn't make sense. So it needs some dramaticalities or you need some kind of theatricality in order to make the documentary more interesting. So this is why we need theater documentary working together. But this is of course not the only reason. There are other reasons you know, that just show that uh, Chinese queer and feminist activists are becoming more creative, they use different media form and artistic forms to express themselves, to, use, to construct their activism and to engage with the audience and general public. So it is a very flexible, creative, contingent form of activism that is art-based, but at the same time, it is also very socially engaged. So, and of course, we are living in this era of media convergence of intermediality. So the filmmakers also make good use of the intermediality of transmedia storytelling to engage the audience and to achieve a what, better result. And of course, such performances are conditional. And of course, they have to take place in particular social and cultural context. So the example that I'm showing mostly took place around 2010s, when the political atmosphere was relatively relaxed, when the censorship was relatively, well, you know, loose, and there was still a permissible space for queer and feminist activism. And uh, now this situation would be even more and more difficult. So we should acknowledge the kind of temporal and spatial, you know, contingencies and conditions of such performance. And in analyzing Zhang Yuan's work, uh, East Palace, West Palace, uh, Chris Barry argued that well, the emphasis is more about access to public discourse, the ability to find a place to stage a public performance at all. This is true, also true to queer activism and feminist activism. So those activists are trying to find a space for this to be picked up by public discussion, to be seen by the public. And of course, they could stage, for example, a protest, etc., but which wouldn't work in China, which would got them in, into trouble. So using this public performance, flag mob, uh, flash mob of activism, in a way is interesting, flexible, engaging, but less politically sensitive. So in a way, actually, it was a good way of assessing the public discourse. But such an access, such a performance is conditional. It's, it is contingent upon technological affordances. It is contingent upon government policies and political atmosphere and so on. So this strategy cannot be reproduced in other circumstances, although it was popular used and creatively used by feminist and queer activists at a particular time. So it shouldn't become a, a model for such activism. So the conditions of such performance is aptly captured by interview with Ai Xiaoming, in, uh, Professor Ai Xiaoming from Song Yat-sen University in uh, the film Vagina Monologues. So uh, Ai Xiaoming said that this is like a cosplay for young people and they can only express themselves through performance. However, in social realities, it would be even more difficult, more difficult to break the norms. So, yes, so that is to acknowledge the kind of masquerade of queer and feminist activism. But perhaps we shouldn't see it as a weakness, we should see it as a strength. So rather than criticizing this as, as, as temporary and so on, we should be thinking about how interesting and flexible the form of activism is. So there are several points that I want to point out. The first one is that uh, cultural activism, so, so the uh, dependence upon those 
cultural performances as well as documentary of cinematic art. And they seem to be apolitical, yet they embody in, uh, political potentials. They are more interesting, creative, and they engage people in a more interesting ways. And second, the reliance on social, uh, on intermediality and transmedia storytelling. That is, the filmmakers were mostly actually, yeah, so younger generation familiar with digital technology. Therefore, they are able to document the events digitally and also disseminate the event digitally. So different formats and different forms of media form interesting dialogues with each other and together they construct a narrative about gender and sexual diversity and equality. And then there's also the notions of the xianchang, which is on the spotness. So in other words, so the queer and feminist activists are sensitive to time, space, as well as the social and cultural context. They know certain things are possible and certain things are not. For example, a public protest in uh, China in the central Beijing wouldn't be possible, but a same-sex wedding shoot would be more likely. And also this shoot, I mean, has to be temporary, it cannot last long. So they disappeared before the police intervention. So in a way, this flash mob type of activism in the form of performing a marriage worked in its particular context and is very creative. And of course, if we think about all these cultural activism or soft activism as I call in my Queer China book. It's very different from the kind of hard form of activism, of protest, march, visibility, and identity politics. So in a way, it's more interesting. It also challenges a Western form of a Western model of activism being promoted to different parts of the world. Indeed, queer activists in different parts of the world are in a way creating flexible and creative forms of activist forms that do not have to follow the Western and global North model. So in a way, most of my research, most of my works from my you know, early school queer comrades, which interrogates what is queer activism and to second book Queer China, which it discusses the notion of soft or cultural activism, the role of literary and visual arts uh, have played in queer activism in China and queer media in China, which addresses the role of media in activism, and in particular, the community media in constructing identities, communities, and politics, to my recent book, Contemporary Chinese Queer Performance, which addresses actually the performative aspect of queer activism. So those words actually mark my efforts in rethinking queer activism in a transnational and decolonized and de-Western context. So that's all for my talk. Thanks very much for your attention.